Sir, we are on live. Huh? Yes, sir. Okay. Sir, is Ken Sir, I'm pissed. Nala cake down with you. Nala cake down with you. Okay. Bro, sir, thank you very much for your cooperation. Okay, sir. Take sir, care, TK, sir. TK, sir, you take care of his profile. Sir, upon the profile, sir, whether we have to go the complete profile or shortlist the profile? Sir, I will short, short on Monday. Short on Monday. I will have timing uh, for the 995 key, you can uh, close the session. Okay, we have formal inauguration by 950. You can separate it. Sir, clean it up, sir. Okay. 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 I assume started, sir. Wait a Hello. Good morning. 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 Thank you, thank you. 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 பாரதி <laughs> <laughs> Camera sir, can you take the sir. Okay, sir. And uh, I have a doubt. I Zoom. I have a YouTube. No, I have a YouTube. Okay. I have a YouTube. I have a YouTube. I have a YouTube. I 
இருக்கு லேப்டாப்ல நான் ஒரு இன்னொரு ஸ்கிரீன்ல யூடியூப் ஓபன் பண்ணலாமா பண்ணலாம் பண்ணலாம் சைலண்டா வச்சுங்க சவுண்ட் இல்லாம வச்சு ஓகே இப்போ நான் என்ன பண்றேன் அதையும் ட்ரை பண்ணி பார்த்துறேன் இந்த பாதி ஸ்கிரீனுக்கு ஜூம் லிங்க்ல கொண்டு வந்துங்க இந்த அந்த நார்மலா வெப்சைட்ல போய் தான யூடியூப் ஓபன் பண்ணிக்கணும் ம் ஸ்ரீதர் சார் சொல்லுங்க சார் क्वेश्चंस வந்து யூடியூபோட லிங்க்ல கீழ வருமா டைப் பண்றது ஆமா சார் அந்த ஸ்டைல டாப் சாட்ல வந்துரும் சார் கொஞ்சம் யாராவது பாருங்க சார் டாப் சாட்ல யாராவது லைவ் இதுல போட்டுருக்காங்களா பாருங்க சார் நிறைய கமெண்ட்ஸ் வந்துட்டே இருக்கு சார் எல்லாம் குட் மார்னிங் சொல்லிட்டே இருக்காங்க ஆடியன்ஸ் யூடியூப் லிங்க்ல ஆ ஆமா சார் வந்துட்டாங்க சார் ஸ்பீக்கர் Hello. Hello, sir. Welcome, sir. Most welcome. Very good morning, sir. Okay, sir. Uh, speak at one time. It's okay. good it's evening for me. Good morning, yes, professor. Oh. Good morning. Good morning, professor. Good morning. Uh. And good evening to me. Yes, sir. It's, it's evening, almost sir. 8 p.m. here. Oh, is it? <laughs> 
So what time is it there now? What time, sir? What time is it? Sir, this is eight twenty. Sir, good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, How are you? Sir, uh, fine, sir. This is Nagarajan from India, sir. Scan, sir. Sir. Tamil Jodi can proceed. Eh? Yeah, by, by, by 825, we can start, sir. In, a, in another three minutes' time, we can start. Sir, uh, nice meeting you, sir. So I'm looking at where the the university is located. It is south of India, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It, it, it is on the bottom corner of uh, the map. So I hear the uh, the dishes are more spicy in the south. Yes, sir. For you, it will be a little bit more spicy. You are most so welcome, many, sir. Yeah, hopefully, maybe in the future. How many students do you have? We have in regular uh, almost 35,000 students. Wow. And Annam University is one of the biggest Asia's residential university. We have a distance education mode where we have more than uh, five lakh students. And uh, we came to know that uh, US is also one of the largest universities in Oreca. Yes, it is one of the biggest universities, that's true. So sorry for disturbing you during your night time, sir. Uh, I hope I think so. We are not much disturbing you. No, no, that's okay. Not at all. So thanks for accepting our invitations. So uh, are there going to be other presenters in this forum or just me? Yes, sir, uh, this session is uh, only you, sir. Followed by that, uh, we have the next presenters. Okay. Sir, we will start by 8.25. Uh, now, now it is uh, eight twenty-four here. It is eight twenty-four a.m. here. How perfect! And so you are uh, almost in the night. Uh, so in, in 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 another one minute time, we will start, sir. Sir, good morning. Welcome you all. So let us formally start the program. Uh, it is over to the program schedule, sir. Yes. Thank you, uh, Nagarajan, sir. Uh, I am Dr. Tanmay Jodi, Associate Professor in the Department of Business Administration, Annamalai University. Uh, I welcome all the participants for this program. So this is an uh, international online workshop on academic research writing and publication. So this is a two days program. And the first session will be handled by Dr. Tugrul Jaya. Uh, he is the professor and doctoral program director, Department of Engineering and Technology Management, Portland State University, USC. And uh, I welcome all the participants, speakers, coordinators, moderators, and head of, head of the departments of various uh, uh, studies in Anamala University and uh, other uh, participants. So this program is uh, for the benefit of the academicians, students and research scholars. And the participants have registered uh, for this program from various countries like uh, India, Algeria, Bangladesh, Bhutan, Cameroon, 
Nigeria, Ethiopia, Ghana, the list goes to 20 to 25. And the participants are from various disciplines. So I formally welcome you all for this program. And uh, I hand over the session to uh, Dr. T. 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 Kartikeyan, sir. Kartikeyan, sir. Thank you, Dr. Tamil Jodi. Good morning, Professor Dam. I am very much privileged to introduce yourself. Professor Dam leads a research group on technology, evaluations, and research applications. His group has had 23 PhD graduates, a bibliometric review of 50 years of uh, research published in technological forecasting and uh, social change. Social change listed one of his papers as the fifth most influential paper and him as the third most influential author. And uh, his research group has been supported by National Science Foundation, National Cooperative Highway, Research Program Energy, Trust of Oregon, US Department of Energy, and uh, He has also been a part of leadership team for conferences, including PICMET and IEEE TENSCON. Under his leadership, submissions to this journal more than double the impact factor improved more than 50% and the journal was ranked among the top journals in the leading citation indices. Professor Dam is the fifth editor in the chief of IEEE Transactions on Engineering and Management. He was given the Research Publication Award by the International Association of Management of Technology and a Fellow Award by the Portland International Center for Management of Engineering and Technology, both in the year 2014. He was awarded the Leading Research Fellowship in the National Research University Highest School of Economics in the Moscow in the year 2018, and Honorary Chair Professor title by Cho Young University of Technology in the year 2019. At PSU, he was given a David E. Wedge Award for the Excellence in Teaching in the year 2017. Outstanding Engineering Research Award given by the Columbia Wilmette Chapter of Sigma 11 Research Honorary in the year 2019. He is the International Honor Society in the Operations Research and Management Science of Informs between the year 2014 and 16 also. He founded the PSU Chapter of Omega Pro as the founding president and has been the faculty advisor for the past 20 years. I am very much privileged in introducing Dr. Tukrul Diam, Professor and Doctoral Program Director, Department of Engineering and Technology Management, Portland State University, USA. Sir, now I hand over the floor to you for your special lecture on the topic research process and technology assessment. This session would prolong up to 9, 5 a.m. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Professor. Okay, so I have uh, about 30 minutes, right? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, let me share what I have now. Can you see this? Yes, sir. And you see the slide? Yes, sir. All right. Good morning to you all. Uh, so I'm going to talk about today uh, the research uh, that I do and with my research group on technology assessment. And I, I uh, really look at it uh, through multiple perspectives. That's what I will talk about today. Uh, but uh, briefly, I want to mention uh, about my research group and what we've been producing. So these are several books that has come out in the recent years and the journal that I've been uh, editing, the title Pili Transactions on Engineering Management. Uh, you, you have already, Dr. Uh, Kartikeyan already mentioned uh, 
uh, that we were listed uh, as a top research uh, group in, in several uh, publications. Uh, and this is just a uh, summary of those publications. Uh, one publication showing us as one of the schools of thought on technology road mapping next to schools like Cambridge. And then another publication basically listed uh, the uh, uh, my research as, as one of the top five research uh, output. Now, of course, this is not possible, just myself. Uh, it's possible with uh, a very bright group of people uh, who work with me from all around the world, uh, ranging from Iran to Saudi Arabia, Peru, Bangladesh, uh, China, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, Pakistan, all over the place, India. And uh, here are the group, uh, basically these are the, the current P, uh, group members, my PhD students and companies and organizations I work with. And these are the uh, graduates from my group. Uh, we just graduated to 25th PhD out of my group. Uh, so they, uh, my, the graduates of my group work in government, industry and university. We just heard that, for example, uh, Dr. Kanam here just received uh, an offer to be an assistant professor in, in San Mary University in Texas, San Antonio. So uh, I'm going to start talking about uh, the, uh, our research approach uh, and with looking at applications in energy first and first looking at energy efficiency program planning in, in the US. Now, we use models like these, hierarchical decision models. Uh, so these uh, models uh, are <clears throat> used when you cannot collect data uh, through surveys uh, and, and you basically have access to executives and decision makers and you can sit down with them and, and help and basically quantify their judgments. Now, how do we do that? We actually form expert panels at, at different levels, really describing the levels of a, a, an organization. So we work with an expert panel at this level, like this is kind of executive level and then expert panels for each uh, depth area, so kind of uh, focus areas. And then we use what's called uh, pairwise comparisons to really quantify experts' judgment. So what they do is when they uh, basically, when we are trying to quantify and calculate the weights of each perspective and criteria, we ask them to, for example, here in this four, uh, make uh, six comparisons and they compare each uh, pair, for example, this pair with this one, I mean, this item with this one and this item with this one and this item with that one, and then and also the others. So, and then they basically distribute 100 points. So when it's uh, equal, it's 50-50, for example. And then they do that through a software and the software calculates the weights as a result. Uh, so I don't, I'm not going to get into the mathematics, and uh, I, I can help you with that if there's questions afterwards. So we use, uh, we basically first use the experts to validate and then to quantify. So in this case, we used it for energy efficiency programs, uh, and we found, for example, when we go went through that, the uh, energy, I mean the impacts savings, benefits are as important as the program development and market dissemination, because really the, the devices, uh, I mean, the energy savings will not be realized if the devices are not acquired through market. And then we were also uh, able to use the, again, at the lower level, do compare, pairwise comparisons and identify which programs would be, would have the, the highest value. And then uh, you could just notice that we have LED lighting for many times. It's really 
we weren't really looking at the technology, but use of technology. So the savings you you will have in commercial offices will be different uh, than the, the savings you will have in street lighting. And then the good uh, the beauty of these models is you could uh, basically run different scenarios by playing with the weights at the highest level, and 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 that basically shows you. What happens if the, if the environment changes, the government changes, and there are different priorities at that level? So the next, uh, I'm going to go through different examples. Uh, and we started with energy. We're going to go uh, on with energy. Uh, so we looked at, uh, we kind of co uh, continued on the earlier model. And the earlier model was done by Dr. Ibrahim Ishkin. He was one of my PhD students, so he's graduated now. And this one was done by Dr. Montaj Kanam, who is now gonna be an assistant professor in uh, Texas. And then he, she uh, really developed a model uh, looking at the, the market uh, uh, readiness in terms of uh, for these devices. Uh, so here we have uh, three different devices such as a solar water heater, tankless gas water heater. And then we were looking at whether or not the mark, everything uh, in legal perspective, economic perspective and whatnot is ready so that the, the devices can be adopted quickly. And then uh, one element in these models, we use value curves. So if you use value curves, you don't have to just limit yourself to uh, a, a number of uh, alternatives to evaluate at the lower, uh, basically part of the model, you could uh, develop these curves and then uh, for each metric, for each basic criterion, and then uh, convert the metric of that criterion to a value between zero and 100. And it's really trying to uh, capture the actual value. And, and, and an example for that is if you're hungry, there's a value for a hamburger, but the value of two, three, five hamburgers is not really five times the value of one burger because after first, maybe second, you're gonna be full. So similarly, like the speed or certain savings is gonna be going asymptotically flat after certain values like here. So we're trying to capture those, right? So with that, we basically identified and, 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 and measured these three uh, devices, their readiness. Uh, and we also uh, basically, depending on where they are in each criterion, going back to the desirability curves, suggested improvement, uh, <clears throat> basically paths for them. The next one uh, was done uh, retrospectively so uh, Dr. Ibra, uh, Dr. Rimal Abutapa, Abutaha did that. Uh, she was also one of my former PhD students. <clears throat> and she uh, is now an assistant professor in Saudi Arabia. So here we developed actually a policy development tool for the adoption of renewable energy. And by evaluating the uh, different policies and, and policy targets that are used in these policies. Uh, so that, for example, tax credits, how does that impact uh, uh, policies of application or reducing investment costs? And then as a result, how, is that, how, how did that impact the adoption? So we worked with state uh, lawmakers and, and energy experts here in the Northwest, quantified this model, as you can see. And then evaluated the uh, the policies, and we found that really there are three groups of policies. They all have a very similar weight. So, regulatory policies, incentive-based policies, and standards. So, and then which told us that if you're trying to go for a big change, you need to use all these groups of policies. So we also use scenarios, as you can see in different ca cases, uh, the, the, uh, the top uh, choices are not changing much, uh, are, are basically providing 
the, the necessary incentives. Now, the next item was also completed recently, R&D project evaluation. This was done by Dr. Edwin Garces. He is also one of my former students. So each one really is a dissertation done by my PhD students. And this time we really looked at, I'll come to the model here, the uh, R&D project evaluation, which is not a new subject, but it is new for regulated nonprofit utility sector in the US. Uh, so that's a specific uh, really group of companies. So we de developed this model and evaluated uh, four R&D proposals that has come to that agency uh, that basically yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the model was developed for. Now, the next couple of uh, studies focused on technology transfer. So again, in the energy sector. And the, the problem was, you saw in the other model, we had R&D proposals, but when the R&D proposals uh, come in, they funded and develop, there are problems in technology transfer after the technology is developed. So one of my former students, Dr. Judith Estep, who is now working in the uh, Department of Energy, <laughs> developed this model to evaluate these R&D proposals also for technology transfer potential. So in, including uh, perspectives like market, organization and social. So then she looked at uh, some technologies such as uh, battery for demand response, which is energy efficiency related area, uh, water heaters used using for energy efficiency and, and, and store refrigerators. And then she uh, calculated the, the technology transfer potential, identify a problematic one, for example, and then develop how uh, proposals can be improved using the value curves that I talked about. Another former student, uh, Dr. Jao Lavoy, who is now working at Daimler Corporation, this time developed a model to evaluate the technology transfer capabilities of an organization. And then we looked at uh, using action research to, uh, in addition to experts and and. Uh, literature to identify the, the elements of this model uh, because Jao was, uh, as, uh, as, as soon as he came to work for me, I put him in this project, in this company until he basically graduated. So he was there doing actually the implementing a technology transfer process. So he was actively uh, understanding and identifying these elements. And this was his model. And he, uh, again, quantified it working with the expert panels and then uh, worked uh, to uh, develop the, uh, calculate the technology transfer capability of this co company and then uh, suggested how it can be improved and almost doubled. And then finally, in energy technologies, we did a study and looked at uh, robotics technologies, and and because the, uh, the 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 consortium of power companies wanted to know which robotics technology would have the highest value for the energy sector, and these are technologies such as you can use in in, in hydroelectric dams like submersible mini robot or concrete crawler, uh, as well as in transmission lines like a transmission line robot or in, in uh, very high heat areas like nuclear reactors, like snake robot. Now, uh, many times when, when we work on these projects, we, we rely on experts. So we find them in through two uh, different uh, methods. One is uh, we work with the agency, the company, they identify their, uh, their experts and we ask them who they know. So that's one group. And the other group is we go to uh, papers, conference papers, journal papers, and patents, and identify the top uh, authors and top inventors, and then look at then how they, their uh, dynamics. So for example, who do they write with? Who do they work with? 
who is citing them and so on and so forth. And in that way, we find those people who are really uh, important, uh, like this example, okay? And then we work with them in these expert panels. So in this case, uh, this case was more uh, robotics oriented. We had different uh, perspectives and criteria, different types of desirability curves, but calculation very similar. Uh, and you can see that uh, uh, they were kind of in the same area with some of them better than the others. But uh, we applied another approach that was developed in our uh, department and asked these experts who are working on these technologies in their labs where these metrics will be in so many years. And by working with them, we then created a forecast, a technology forecast. And we can basically see where the values, how they're gonna improve. Now, this tells a lot of things. This tells decision makers that if they don't change the development, uh, basically uh, investments, this is the time it will take. So if they accelerate that, they can actually pull that in, right? So we also ran scenarios, of course, uh, because things change, governments come and go. And now we have different, basically, cha uh, value changes over time. And really, this tells us that uh, this basically helps decision makers to see where they should focus on their investments if they want a certain technology to come in. Now, from energy, we're diving into health and medicine. So we applied this approach in, in that area too. Uh, very recently, actually, my 25th student, uh, Dr. Amir Shaigan, uh, just uh, did this study. He graduated uh, and uh, he's now working at Oregon Health and Science University. What he did was he really uh, came up with a technology maturity assessment for health research centers. Because there's so many technologies being implemented and so on and so forth. There have been trouble before. So what should be, how should they basically identify areas of improvement? So I'll just show you how he worked. So he first identified a model through the literature then working with experts, modified the model and then quantified the model working with the experts. And then uh, he looked at a couple of health institutes, calculated their scores, as you can see in different cases, and then uh, basically suggested improvement opportunities using the, his desirability curves, and then how they can increase their technology mat management maturity. Another one, uh, Dr. Lilia Hogabom, who is teaching in our department, and he, he was my PhD student too. She looked at wearable technologies so that doctors can uh, really monitor their patients. And what she did was she developed a model to assess the adoption potential. And these are the devices she looked at and working with the experts again, quantified her model and ran different scenarios, as you can see, and in different scenarios, different uh, devices are preferable than the others. Uh, another uh, recent study, we looked at this time, uh, remote monitoring of senior people, old people, uh, because that's really where a lot of the healthcare costs are. Uh, so Dr. Uh, Hamad Alanazi did that. He was one of my students too. And he focused on remote patient monitoring and specifically teleconsultation. And he re really looked at uh, what kind of strategies and policies will remove barriers such as financial uh, or cultural that will help the perceptions of the users and as a result, and in adoption. Uh, and uh, as you can see, the uh, really economic strategies uh, 
very important. And and we have seen that play in the COVID case, where the when the government uh, invested more into these technologies in healthcare institutes, we have seen the adoption of this technology very very rapidly. The next one was is very recent too. Uh, this was done by Dr. Said Al Zahrani, who is also an assistant professor in Saudi Arabia now. Uh, Said uh, looked at cybersecurity this time in the healthcare uh, again setting, and uh, looked at uh, the uh, the adoption. So uh, and and developed the model as you can see, and then uh, looked at couple of different uh, uh, institutes and their readiness to adopt this technology and what they should do to improve the adoption in both cases. This one was a bit dated, uh, but it's actually very relevant. Uh, this was done by Dr. Leong Chang, one of my other, one of my former students again. And she looked at, he looked at uh, the uh, the R&D strategies, and in the case of Chinese pharmaceuticals, and really, <clears throat> we looked at these uh, uh, biopharmaceutical, I mean, uh, biotechnologies, which were used, if you look at, if you remember, in development of vaccines recently, and he really looked at what kind of uh, uh, innovation uh, strategy the company should follow and what kind of resources they should use. And uh, interesting uh, results out of this was that uh, the imitative innovation was seen as still the choice in China, although the China has been trying to uh, remove, I mean, distance themselves from it. And the small and medium enterprises were seen as the most efficient uh, compared to uh, state-owned enterprises. And by using this model, you can basically, uh, for example, recomponent uh, vaccines, which again, what was you, what was been done recently, right? Uh, what kind of development strategies should be followed? Uh, and it would be interesting to look at now whether or not they use these types of uh, resources. Now we used uh, this approach in infrastructure too. Uh, one of the infrastructure is of course, developing technology standards. Uh, so one of my former students, Dr. Sa uh, Ramin Neshati, uh, was working for the uh, in, for Intel Corporation, and he developed a model uh, so that the Intel, uh, I mean, or any other company could evaluate uh, whether or not they should join a standards body. The standards body are where when companies get together, to develop technologies to reduce risk and cost. Like uh, they did that for Bluetooth, for Wi-Fi, for USB and so on and so forth. So Ramin was involved in USB development. So he worked with his colleagues who worked on that in the past and, uh, and really looked at uh, quantified the model for USB, which is red in this case, and found that Intel should join and drive the USB uh, standards development because that's it's it's been to its highest benefit compared to others and actually that's what Intel had done in the past and uh, just showing that uh, it's the, the the result is because it helps uh, its uh, uh, product strategies and and market expansion and as you can see over time, Things have changed, uh, not too much, but some uh, licensing become more important. And that's really to do with the, the maturity of the industry. In, in 20, 25 years, it got more mature now. Now, around the infrastructure, of course, uh, research is important. Uh, we work with NSF and one of my former students, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Gibson, who is now uh, a professor in, in Colorado, uh, and we received funding from National Science Foundation and evaluated, developed a model to evaluate research centers of NSF. A specific program was uh, 
industry university collaborative research centers. And we basically work with the center program director and center directors to develop and quantify this model. And then looked at about uh, six different centers that were all at the same level in terms of time. Uh, and we uh, quantified uh, and, and calculated their values, as you can see, how they are contributing. Uh, so an NSF, so that NSF can use that to make recommendations of improvement. And we made recommendations, as you can see, that will help them improve their scores. Now, another recent one, uh, Dr. Gusan Barham, one of my former students, he is now working at Amazon because of his really understanding of uh, the uh, big data, if you will. And he looked at uh, the readiness of cities because smart city is a big buzzword and big data also. And a lot of cities have started big data projects because they wanted to be a smart city, uh, but failed. So we, uh, Hussam, developed a model which will be, which will help the cities to evaluate their readiness before they start a project. So after picking a project and before they start executing it, they basically uh, will use this model and see if they are ready. And as you can see, the model has people elements and data scientists uh, came out as one of the top uh, basically uh, criteria here. And also data security and privacy. But really uh, it, 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 it tells us that people are really important in implementing these projects. And then he looked at projects such as traffic safety sensor project, connected streetcar project. These are projects that are uh, not implemented by the city of Portland. Uh, and then basically identified, uh, calculated the, val the value, I mean, there's readiness value, and then made recommendations on uh, how they can improve these values, as you can see. Now, we also, I mean, construction and project management are other two elements of infrastructure. Uh, the, in the highway construction, uh, companies use different sets of tools such as value engineering and so on and so forth. So we developed a model and Rafa Khalifa, Dr. Rafa Khalifa, who is now working as an independent consultant in Libya has worked on this. And he evaluated uh, tools such as value engineering and combination with other uh, methodologies uh, like construction review and so on and so forth uh, so that the companies can decide which one to use based on their uh, situation. And finally, another, of course, infrastructure element is uh, the uh, oil uh, extraction and uh, especially offshore. Uh, another student, uh, former student of, one, of mine, Dr. Uh, Abdul Hakim Giyadedi, uh, he looked at uh, to evaluate offshore oil projects uh, for Libya, as you can see, and develop a model. And in, in this one, of course, we had one of the, uh, in addition to economic, political elements and environmental and safety. Those were the important perspectives, right? So he uh, used these, developed the model and, and evaluated these three uh, projects and provided feedback on this. Now, as you can see, I've gone through maybe 20 different projects here. Uh, it's really work of these, uh, my PhD students, the committee members, and, and also my advisor, Dunda Kokaglu, who actually developed this model originally. And when you add all these people's work years, this is more than two centuries worth of, two men centuries worth or person centuries worth of work, compressed into 30 minutes. So uh, you need to take your time to, and then, uh, uh, watch it again afterwards. But what we are saying here is there's multiple perspectives uh, and you should evaluate, I mean, technologies considering these multiple perspectives and 
These models can be used at corporate level, at government level, regional, international, and it really helps the organization communicate and reach an agreed upon plan, which is the most important thing. So with that, I end my talk. I thank you for hosting me today and open for questions. I have, we, we have a few minutes for questions today. Thank you, Professor. It's a great work of your PhD scholars, which I have seen in all the areas, right from uh, LED lights and solar uh, water heaters. And then we went to the energy management and then market diffusion potentialities and uh, technology transfer assessment. Then we went to robotic technology. There I could notice the technology development envelope model, which we have used it there. Then application in infrastructure, then application in uh, industry technology standardization, then application in uh, science and technology planning, then cyber security, then project management, and then uh, national technology planning and uh, applications in health and the management side, health and medicine sector, uh, application in healthcare management and application in healthcare planning and application in the remote monitoring, and then big data readiness in smart cities. All the PhD scholars work uh, with uh, great models. We could see it is being uh, applied wherever it is possible. All your research scholars' projects are really immensely useful to the society, and also the socially applicable models you have developed Every model which you have developed in all these areas like uh, tech, energy management to technology management to that of medicine and also application areas, I could see it is really useful for the individuals, really useful for the society, really useful for the government and really it will be useful for the future studies also. Because uh, every application oriented research which you have contributed is to be noted down here. I was thinking about asking a question. Actually, no questions were there uh, from the audience in this session, but uh, I have a question here. I could see your research team extending up to Pakistan. I kindly place my request here. We also like to be a part of your PhD team. If you could uh, incorporate us also in future for your research program, we could be, do some studies sure. here. I have actually one uh, person from India, who is now in Netherlands, uh, Dr. Mahak Sharma. She's been attending my research group recently. We have just published a paper in the Technological Forecast and Social Change. Definitely. But yes, please send me an email with your interests and we'll, I will be looking forward to working with you. Thank you, Professor. Under the leadership of Dr. S.K. Nagarajan, we would like to drop you an email also. I was thinking about why there is no research contributing towards uh, big data. And uh, I could see, Im immediately I could see there is, a, uh, there is a PhD thesis on big data with your uh, work on uh, readiness in smart cities. Actually, all your sessions, I could, see, I could feel that uh, you'd be the proud person to present all your PhD scholars report in a nutshell of half an hour about the 10 theses, what they have published and what how they have done their work. We could see that uh, exactly all the application-oriented work, what you have contributed to this society. It's really useful and it's the uh, right time for us to thank you for spending your valuable time for our entire team of Anamala University Department of Business Administration, making this session wonderful and enlightened with the contributions of your PhD scholars by going through from energy management to application of technology in energy management, application of technology in health sector, application of technology in uh, uh, robotics. We could see wherever possibility is there, how you have contributed your technology applications in all these areas. All your PhD theses have been validated with a model. Basically, you have developed a model, that application model is being applied everywhere. I feel uh, very much enlightened. Uh, by listening to your session. It's really thankful for your presence and your uh, highlighting information. Apart from that, your time management is uh, really wonderful. You started at 8.30 and ended exactly at 9 o'clock. It shows that you are a very dedicated person in our teaching profession. I must thank you one and all for enlightening us with this valuable information. 
with your presentation, sir. Thank you once again. Thank you, sir. You're welcome and thank you for having me. So have a great day. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Kamra, sir. Kamra, sir. Unmet for the uh, video post Pandra. Okay, okay. Come on, sir, close the session. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, yes, sir. Close for Okay, uh, sir. Thank you. Um, Ardu, so next we will uh, meet at 9.15 for the inaugural session. Yes, Thank sir. You.